Well, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Judy Morlata tonight. Um, I first met Judy when I came as a um, summer intern to National Public Radio, and Judy was my supervisor. And at the time, uh, they had just finished running a 26-part series called Wade in the Water, African-American Sacred Music Traditions, and Judy had been the senior producer. This um, series was so highly regarded that it won the George Foster Peabody Award. So when I, when I got to NPR, things were just buzzing. And it, I had listened to several of the uh, series, you know, at home on my radio. It was just fabulous. Um, in addition to this wonderful series, Judy was also the first education reporter for National Public Radio, and also the creator and executive producer of NPR's first Hispanic program, Latin File. In addition to working in broadcasting for nearly 30 years, uh, Judy has also been affiliated with Howard University in many capacities. I think she's in charge of the radio station for a while, as I remember. Um, and also, she was the Executive Director of Communications and Marketing for Howard and was a professor. She's now a Professor Emerita, um, having retired in the recent past. Um, Judy's background is she uh, considers herself one of the GRITs, and GRIT stands for Girls Raised in the South. She comes from Tallahassee, Florida. I, you know, the experiences that Judy had uh, growing up were so different than my own, um, growing up as a white girl in New England. So um, it's, Judy has written a book about that and you'll be hearing more about that tonight. It's just, a, just an amazing book and great examples, stories of growing up in the South. Um, now, in addition, she's written two books with a third one on the way. Uh, her first book, God Ain't Sleep, Yesterday, Today, and Tomorrow, was published a few years ago. And more recently, Beyond, Beyond Roses, An Obligation to Speak, which is basically what, this, uh, what the talk tonight will be centered on. Uh, Judy's next book, Really Dancing Beyond Dreams, The Collective Memory of a Black Love Story, will be published in the near future. Um, the last thing I'd like to say about Judy is um, having spent the summer with her, working with her, the one thing that really stands out for me that I, that I learned was that if you have the vision, creativity, and determination to do things, the possibilities are limitless. I had never really known that before. There, I had never had a role model that showed me that you can do things. It, it's, um, I saw it in action and it, it really was a watershed summer for me. So it is at this time my distinct pleasure and privilege to welcome Dr. Judy Moore Lata. Thank you so very much, Victoria. I tell you, I, I, just, I just really uh, appreciate you and I appreciate this group. Uh, I appreciate this opportunity. Um, I would like to call myself, in addition to calling myself one of the grits, I tell people that I am um, the daughter of Laverne Moore, who was a colored teacher in the segregated South. And she was the daughter of Cornelia Jackson, who was a domestic worker in the pretend not to be segregated North. And she was the daughter of Julia Hand, who was found in a cornfield in a basket in Ohio in the mid 1800s. Uh, so it's important for me to remember that because it grounds me and it helps me to stay uh, clear about not only who I am, but uh, the work that I have to do, it's very humbling. So I'm, I'm, I'm just honored to be here. I, I, I might say, however, in, in that lineage, um, I, I am also the daughter of Oscar Moore, who was a professor at Florida A&M University, who was the son of Fitzgerald Moore, who was a painter, 
who came through Ellis Island at the 20th century, turn of the 20th century, who was the son of Prince Moore from Barbados, who um, was a sugar farmer. So there you go. So you know who I am. <laughs> uh, but you know, th there's something, and I thank you so very much for, for that, but there's something about the power of the story and the power of the narrative that, um, that just kind of gives you an opportunity to connect with people. And, uh, and, and so I appreciate that. I, I, I wanna just say um, that I am just excited about the work that you're doing with Take Part. I mean, this um, is just so very, very important. And I know that there are uh, so many of you who uh, have been a part of Take Part, and then there are others who are probably visiting, but in just kind of looking at the work that you're doing, um, what's exciting is that you have chosen to do what, you, what you're doing. Uh, and, and being anti-racist is actually a radical choice. <laughs> it's a very radical choice. And, um, and it's, so I, I hope that during the course of this evening, uh, one of the things that we'll be able to do is that you will be able to kind of ask yourself about that radical choice that you've made and what it means and then what it means for you personally as well as for your relationships and things of that sort. So I hope you have pen and pencil. Uh, I've got mine. Uh, uh, and or your device, if you're using your device, so that you can just kind of think through, there'll be some rhetorical questions, but there'll be some other kinds of questions that are designed not to just to be a performance, but are really designed to help you to begin thinking about your, your own work and, and the work that you're doing. Um, so, so, so we're really talking about this whole thing of using conversations to heal the racial divide. And, you know, I thought about that that, that word heal, um, because that's been attached to uh, the thinking that I've been doing for a while. And it's, it's really kind of come um, full circle most recently. We're talking uh, about healing. And, uh, and of course, you probably, um, as with the rest of the world, kind of uh, are you know, very well aware of where we are now one day after yesterday. Um, and, and there's been quite a bit of talk about healing. And, and you know, one of the things that uh, President Biden said night before last, in fact, was um, to heal, we must remember. He said to heal, we must remember. And of course, that's one of the things that's really very, very important for us to do. We are all in this um, situation where we have kind of been here for months um, and 2020 we know was a year that we will never ever forget. It's a, it's a year that we will remember for um, the pandemic and, and for the, uh, the assault on black and brown bodies and for uh, the uh, civil unrest and the um, public displays of racial inequities and you know, um, and then in the middle of everything, uh, we had an election. Um, and clearly there was the kind of the emergence of the two worlds. Um, and the two worlds really then of course collided uh, two weeks ago, two weeks and a day ago um, in Washington DC. And we all know what happened on January the 6th. Um, but nothing in this world is more dangerous than sincere ignorance and conscientious stupidity. That's what Martin Luther King said, whose birth we celebrated just recently and whose vision we celebrated. Uh, but what we saw um, was this kind of collision of two worlds. And of course, you know about it um, in, in Portland, as in, in other places around the nation, uh, you, you know this, that we have been experiencing really a, a kind of a, a sobering lesson on the dangers of misinformation and what happens uh, to relationships and, and the like when, when that happens. Um, so what do we do about that? Um, how, you know, how are we to kind of address that? How are we to, 
uh, be our better selves? How can we be better and turn the corner? So, so this, this evening for just a few minutes, I wanna tell you a couple of things. I wanna share with you a few things. Uh, a story about a rose. Um, and then I want to urge you to examine yourself. Um, we are gonna probably read a, a couple of excerpts if we can, one or, or two excerpts from um, my book, Beyond Roses, An Obligation to Speak, that will help kind of make some of the points clear. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit about what happens when you go in search of a conversation and then have some time for uh, questions and answers. Okay, so let's start with uh, the rose my mother envisioned. Now, you know, uh, I really wish you could have met my mom. Um, she, Laverne Moore was an extraordinary woman, but she was in Tallahassee, Florida, uh, and she had a uh, place, she, she and my father had a home that was just uh, a very warm home that, uh, a place where they acknowledged a lot of people, people from all different backgrounds came and there were stories that were shared and people that were shared there. And my mama used to like flowers, but she didn't have a green thumb. She couldn't grow anything, but she loved flowers. So she, what she would do was that she bought plastic flowers and she went to Walmart and she'd get whatever was on sale and she'd put them out there in the front. And of course they were just lovely flowers and everybody in the neighborhood knew that Mrs. Moore had plastic flowers, but nobody ever said anything. Um, then what happened was my mom passed uh, and a year or so after she came, then uh, after she, she made her transition, um, well, she'd come to live with us and then she made her transition. Uh, and a year or so after that, our neighbor in Tallahassee, Florida sent me this picture of a, of a rose that was growing right where those other formerly plastic roses had been. But this was a live rose, not on a, not on a bush, not on anything, it was just a single rose. And uh, it, was, it was just a, a lovely rose. And this is actually the rose. Uh, now, the thing about it is the rose has come back every year since my mom died. <laughs> Uh, and and this is this is true. Now here's just different ones of the rose. Sometimes it's accompanied by uh, another rose or or two, and sometimes it's just by itself. And nobody ever planted this rose. Nobody ever kind of cultivated it. Nobody still to this day cultivates it at the at the house in Oak Knoll. But it it is uh, it was a very clear kind of thing for me, because what it said to me was not necessarily that this was my mom's spirit in, 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 embodied in this rose, but clearly there was a message of some sort uh, that, that my mother was sending. And, uh, and it, it kind of uh, uh, evolved into uh, the book that, uh, that I wrote and that I'm going to share a little bit with you this evening, uh, Beyond Roses, an Obligation to Speak. Um, because it, it, it incorporated so many things. Now, without, without her knowing what she was doing in that household, um, my mother was really kind of embodying this concept of Ubuntu, which is a South African concept. Um, uh, uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu talks about it. And it is, I am because of you. I am because of you. And, and it really has to do with the um, humanity as, as a quality that we owe to each other. And it suggests that you really can't be human all by yourself. And sometimes people think that, uh, but that's not the case. And so we really have an, a, 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 an innate uh, interdependency and a, co a connectedness. And so what that means is that we almost have an obligation if we will, to stretch ourselves, to understand experiences that are beyond our, us and beyond our own. Um, you know, it's, it's not easy work. <laughs> and I, I'm sure that you know that from the work that you're doing, that it's not easy work. So, let, so let's look at what this means. So um, 
So th there are a few facts that sometimes we refuse to acknowledge. And um, again, kind of going back, um, these are some things that I now know that my, my mother um, uh, probably knew very well um, because they were things that were embedded in stories. They were embedded in the lives of people that I met. Uh, they were embedded in uh, the realities that kind of circled around, uh, around me. And, and one, of the, one of the things that became very clear is that there's been really a long history of entitlement in uh, the United States. And it's really kind of been connected with the history of violence. Now you have to understand that, that I grew up in a cocooned community where there wasn't a lot of open discussion about violence but sometimes there was very veiled discussion about violence. And so some of the things that sometimes we refuse to acknowledge and we kind of gloss over and forget to think about or, or even forget to consider the implications of are things like the legacy of slavery and racial terror lynchings, legally authorized segregation, um, which is in its, itself uh, a form of organized violence. All of these actually are forms of organized violence, the, the genocide of indigenous people, the abuse of people of color, um, continuing manifestations of, of racial hierarchy and, and bias, um, and the bottom line fact that racism is taught and is learned, um, as is tolerance. And, and so, you know, and these are things that we, we sometimes forget, but it's important for us to remember. It's important for us to remember. So where do we start? All right, so this. So one of the questions, and I'd like for you to think about this and think about your own situation and not, so not to think about this just kind of in isolation apart from anything, um, um, but is to think about what is the lens through which you see yourself? And, 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 and of course, I'm, I'm talking about, you know, how, how do you identify yourself? What groups do you um, uh, associate with? Um, how do you think others see you? Because that's, that's a part of, of, of the lens. Um, and, and then what's inside that nobody sees? And then what's outside that everybody sees and they think they know about you. And this thing that we, that we try to get at that's called bias is something that begins to unfold as we, um, as we begin to kind of ask questions about ourselves. So there, so, so there, so, and, and, they, and these are exercises um, that you can do uh, beyond beyond this because we, we won't have a whole lot of time to, <clears throat> to to do it per se. But these are things that you can think about. Um, but one of the one of the questions that you that you have to ask yourself that I have to ask myself we all do is is it possible to coexist with people who have radically different ideas from you? You know, it's a very important question, especially right now. And then the kind of the, the continuation of that is a conversation with, the, with those folks even possible. Now, I don't um, pretend to be an expert in any of this. Uh, again, uh, you, you, you see how I come at this. So while I um, uh, have, uh, studied uh, and uh, have taught in and have worked in the area of communications. Um, you know, th this is this is all territory that is new for um, for all of us. And so, one of the things, one of my personal goals, is really kind of to to awaken us to our full history. And when I say our full history, you know, <laughs> I, I'm not I'm not talking about just kind of um, uh, something that is just there, uh, but to things that we that we uh, kind of close out. Um, you know, so, so many people say, well, this is not the America that I knew when, when they saw what happened at the Capitol um, 
two weeks ago. They said, this is not the America I, I know. Um, and to see the, the Confederate flag in the, um, in the, um, in the Capitol, uh, to see the nooses that were being uh, constructed outside, to see the violation of, of, of that, you know, th this is not the America I know. But if we look and understand our full history, it is a part of the America that we know, that we may have ignored, that we may have overlooked, that we may not have paid attention to. Uh, and so one of my goals is, is to kind of help us to learn how to understand as much of our, that full history as we can and to help us to appreciate in the process our common humanity. Um, and as we have this common humanity, uh, to find where is that leveling ground? Where is that place uh, where we must turn? And of course, it's to facts. <laughs> Um, you know, there's been so much discussion and um, recently uh, about this idea of truth and, and tr truth, it seems, has never mattered more than it does right now. Um, but, uh, but, you know, because we've been, we're coming out of an era, a time, a period when, when lies have really dominated so much of, of everything and it's affected all that uh, of life that's surrounding us, the healthcare, the racial wealth gap, the you know, ideas about climate, everything. Um, and those lies have separated us so much that, um, uh, that one of the things that we've learned is that we have um, really seen the dangers of misinformation. Um, so um, so it, it becomes very important for us to, to find ways to bridge the divides that separate us. And of course, a part of that is going back to, um, going back to um, our, our, our basic connections. Now, I'd like to offer a way, this is not necessarily the way, it is a way, a strategy for how we can start to make that bridge. How can we, uh, begin to make those connections. And one of the things that I like to think about is this idea that I call story hope. It's the power of the personal narrative to promote discussions and to build bridges. It's just simply that. The power of the personal narrative to promote discussions and to build bridges. So it's really a kind of a, you know, a tool for conversations. It's a starting point. Um, and, and, and one of the reasons for that is that everybody craves stories. People love stories. And what I've found is that there is a healing power in narratives. So I wanted to share um, uh, just a little bit here um, and want to just read a little bit something from, uh, from the book. But uh, be, as a kind of a setup to this, I, I just like to just kind of for us to think about this and ponder this for a second. This is a quote from uh, Bishop uh, Reverend Dr. William Barber. <clears throat> and um, this is what he said. It was St. Augustine who said, hope has two children, anger and courage. And you have to talk about both of them. Anger at the way things are, the way you grieve deeply, the way you're bothered, that looks at things and says, this is just not right. But then you have to have courage after anger to be willing to address it and the courage to do it with love and nonviolence. <clears throat> and that is a, is a really key kind of thing. Um, the excerpt that I want to read <clears throat> is from um, a chapter that's called Roses in the Wilderness. <clears throat> and so this picture that you see here is, uh, is one that I found in the photo album that my uh, father um, uh, left to me. And, uh, and, you know, and one of the things about my, both, both of my parents is that they were very meticulous in doing a lot of things. And so they, they, they did certain things. So these numbers that you see here, for example, on these people um, were put there by my dad. <clears throat> Um, 
But the, the, the story that I want to share with you has a couple of principal, uh, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going to read you the whole thing, <clears throat> but I'm going to read you a, a good portion of it. But it has a couple of prin principal characters. It, it starts with an incident that happened in Portland uh, in 2017. And um, you will recognize that those of you who are from Portland and even those who are not, you will. Um, and then it uh, connects with the folks in this picture by um, a story that my dad told me that uh, took place 80 years before that incident. Uh, and you'll start to see some similarities between what happened um, in Portland and what happened with, with, when my dad heard that. Now, by the way, my dad is number four here. That's, that's Oscar Moore there. Uh, and these were all students at West Virginia State College in 1932. Uh, they were called the college boys. And they were called the college boys because they worked as waiters and uh, ship stewards and other things uh, on the off semesters so they could get enough money to go to school. But uh, they, after they left, um, and this is just all on the side, after they left, left West Virginia, uh, state, then they became um, professionals in different ways. So one became a college professor, one became a judge, one became an entrepreneur, uh, uh, one became a physician. Uh, so they, you know, they had different kinds of things. But so you, as you listen to this, I, I want you to listen for that. And then for the man who really kind of influenced them in more ways than a little bit. And that was a man by the name of Dr. John W. Davis. He was the president of West Virginia State uh, at that time and was one of only a few black college presidents in the 1930s. Okay, so I'm going to read this uh, excerpt. The atrocities are so severe and so frequent that it's easy to be dumbfounded, hard to imagine, and even and even harder to reason how life so fragile and precious can be considered so lightly. Sad commentary that only a few people are willing to cross lines to defend the sanctity of people different from themselves. On a Portland, Oregon commuter train, two girls of color, one Muslim, one not, are verbally accosted by a self-proclaimed white supremacist. Three white strangers come to their defense. Two of those strangers are stabbed to death. The other is critically wounded. A trickle of objections uh, surface here and there across the country, but no unified national outrage. Expediency can silence people, especially if the stakes are high. When precious things like jobs and families and reputations hang in the balance, then the option to be silent becomes more attractive. When people think that their own lives might be in jeopardy if they stand for someone else, they hesitate. When I think about the men who lost their lives on the commuter train in Portland in 2017, for no reason other than they dared to speak, I think about the resurgence of a terrible reality, a desolate and empty place. It's a place where anger and courage collided. My father heard a story eight decades earlier that points toward how even the most barren of territories can inspire hope and provide fertile ground for roses. Dad told me that when he was a student at then all black West Virginia State College in 1932, the world shook. As he sat under the tutelage of a man the students lovingly called Prexy, the world around them swirled with hatred. In 1919, Dr. John W. Davis, Prexy, at 31, had become the youngest president in the history of the school and was one of only a few black men presiding over colleges by the 1930s. As an outspoken advocate of Negro education, Prexy gave advice, warnings, and wisdom and saw himself creating a revolution to combat the surrounding hatred, one student at a time. He knew the world would welcome his charges and he wanted them to be ready. In the college's mandatory Sunday chapel services, Dr. Davis reminded students that they mattered, that they had God-given power and that they could change the entire segregated South. 
And then it goes on and there uh, is a, a litany of what was going on around there uh, at that time, in, in, including the um, um, murders and lynchings that were happening in nearby places and, um, and a number of the uh, kinds of social injustices that were, that were happening. Silence was not an option and allies were not a gift to be taken for granted. Hard lessons carried bitter truths and demanded that people of good conscience speak on behalf of those who were vulnerable. On one occasion, dad heard Dr. Davis tell the story of Bishop Joseph Hartzell, a white humanitarian philanthropist and preacher who lived his conscience and spoke his mind. According to President Davis, those who knew Bishop Hartzell called him a friend of the Negro, a label that may have cost him his life. On the Bishop's 87th birthday, two white men surreptitiously entered his home. Who knows their intent? They may have heard him give one of his unabashedly outspoken sermons about shared fundamental human decency and been outraged, or they may have watched as he operated in the Freedmen's Aid Society coming to the defense of Negro youth who had no voice. They may have resented his co-founding Meharry Medical School to educate Negroes, or they may have simply broken into his house to steal from him. Whatever the reason, they entered his home spewing hatred and ransacked it, took his watch and $15 and an air pump and cut his phone lines and then his throat. Despite potential calamity, President Davis told his students, you must become your better self. He mesmerized the students as he, he urged them to step into their own. How should you answer whenever the land is barren and the soul is in a wilderness? Is it possible to cultivate friendships or roses in the desert? What, he asked them, are you going to do? And then he answered, as you play, he said, paraphrasing Isaiah 35, one, consider it in your play. As you sing, let it reverberate in your song. As you think, think of the wilderness about and see if you can make it blossom into a rose. The words rejected an angry cynicism in favor of a compassionate toughness. The plea to become one's better self in the face of adversity called individuals to respond to horrendous situations by turning unvoiced rage into courageous action. The words expected uh, to find hope in the bleakest of moments. Do what you can to change things. Don't wallow in victimhood or revel in victory. Never use the excuse of tough times to ignore work to be done and do it, even if you are not the one benefiting. No excuses, you have power. When people begin to change, be transformed, care, then the land will heal and it will blossom. My father listened in the 1930s as President John W. Davis spoke. The men on the commuter train 80 years later in Portland, Oregon, never met my father, likely never heard of Prexy or his story, but the message rippled through the air and the ages. In a hard place, be a rose, petals, thorns, and all. Some encourage from anger and make hope live. And so what that does is that gives us uh, a sense of, of, of one of the kinds of stories uh, that you would find in, in, uh, in, in that I use uh, to do what I call challenging the long silence. And, uh, and, and the organization of this book is that it really does that, just that. So there are short pieces that in various ways um, are from my own personal experience um, that have to do with race and racism. Um, and, but they are designed to be used as models for how you can uh, tap into your own experiences and tell those stories. So the first part of the book 
um, has stories dealing with what makes us human and, and speaking with moral authority and threats to our personhood, uh, different ways of seeing, uh, and even code switching um, and white privilege. And then the, the second part has more stories that uh, point to, and, and, and well, let me just say one thing about the, those first stories that, that in, in many ways they reinforce a lot of the, the basic lessons that I learned growing up uh, in that household that had plastic flowers. Uh, what, but what it, what it means uh, to understand um, how to grow, how to, to live and to love in a cocoon, which is very much what, what I did uh, growing up on the campus of Florida A&M. Um, and, 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 and it's also kind of understanding that, that I grew up in, again in the segregated South uh, and the people that I knew, um, the white people that I knew were not the barometer of my existence. And for some people that is a kind of, you know, unusual thing. I mean, we, we, we didn't, they, they weren't, and we can talk about that. Um, but I grew up in a place where, where black people loved their children as an obsession. And so that love became a part of the lens through which I saw the world. And that's, some of that is kind of reflected in, in these early stories. Then the stories in the second part really kind of deal with having radical empathy and having hope in collective work and, having, and finding hope in legacy and then finding hope in progeny. And then the last part of the book really is designed to be interactive. So there are prompts and there are questions and there are, are things that are specifically designed uh, to help you, I call it a toolkit that kind of helps you to, to do uh, certain kinds of things. Okay, now I think we probably will maybe skip that one. These are, these are some other stories. Um, um, well, let me just kind of go back and just say, um, this one is about code switching. I'm, I'm not going to read that you know, for, for time right now, but if we have time, maybe we can come back and do some things with that. But, but code switching is, uh, is, is, a t is a tool that some use in conversations and we can talk about how that works. Um, and we also, this is another story um, that we'll do. But anyway, um, let, let's take a look at this. I, you know, I, I found this quote very interesting. Mich Michelle Alexander, if you have not read the, uh, the New Jim Crow, you need to uh, read that. I mean, it's, it's a classic. Um, Michelle Alexander does that. But one of the things that she said, and she doesn't say it in the New Dream, Jim Crow, but she actually said this in a conversation, in an interview that she, that she did uh, several years ago. She said, if we are to build revolutionary movements of a multiracial, multi-ethnic, multi-faith, multi-gender democracy in which every voice and every life truly matters, we are going to have to embrace and tap into the revolutionary spirit of the ancestors. It's an important thought because it connects us to things that have gone before. So I just wanted to kind of just have that. So uh, what have I learned about myself? What did I learn about myself in writing this book? What would I hope you would learn about yourself as you begin to use this, this, this concept of story hope. And, uh, and, and what, I, what I'm urging you to do is to try stories, to try story hope in, in some different ways. And, and we offer some ways that you can do that. But one of the things that I, I, I came to understand is that I really appreciate the power of the story, of the narrative. I mean, I just get so excited with, with stories and, um, and of course, we know that it can't be, we, we can't just kind of follow la along and just do stories, but the stories have to uh, point us towards something. And it, as we are working on, on these uh, larger issues 
uh, it's, it's important for us to work on the fundamental issues too. And another thing I learned is that false and artificial divisions between people are made by human beings. And we do it all the time and we do it sometime unconsciously or subconsciously, um, but it's, and, and they are artificial. And it's important to fi figure out what those are. And then I learned about myself is that I really am an optimist <laughs> and that I really do believe that um, a single voice can motivate and can change things. Uh, and, you know, and, and people always, of course, this week we have been thinking about single voices in a lot of ways. You know, we, we, we started with the Martin Luther King Day, the day of service, and people mentioned King, but there are so many voices, so many voices from that period uh, that changed things. Uh, and then we kind of moved to yesterday and that incredible uh, experience that we saw with the inauguration and all of the voices that we began to hear, including the voice of that wonderful um, uh, young woman who was uh, the, the youth, the National Youth Poet Laureate. Uh, oh my goodness, and how, how wonderful. But I, I really think that the voices can change things. Uh, and then I, then I learned that I, that I search for and I appreciate character and language and, as well as my own vulnerability. And I put those all together and as I do that, um, then I begin to find that there are stories that emerge that um, I wouldn't have even dreamed of um, sharing, but things that I knew. Um, and then the final thing is that I, that I learned that I can tell history by knowing that history is about relationships and making choices. And when we start to think about history in that way, it's, it gets back to that thing that uh, President Biden was talking about in terms of remembering. Um, because if we think about history in terms of dates and incidents and things of that sort, um, then we're missing the mark. But we, if we think about history in terms of relationships and choices, then we're starting to get closer to where we can have a uh, real conversation. So I'd like for you to think about your own experiences with race and what makes having a dialogue difficult for you. Uh, what, what is it about that? Um, and, and there are, are three things that I would suggest. One is uh, fear. Um, another is um, failure. And another is uh, would be our intractable uh, attitudes. And you know, about, and we, we mentioned King, and one of the things that King said is that, uh, about fear in particular, he said, people fail to get along because they fear each other. And they fear each other because they don't know each other. And they don't know each other because they've not communicated with each other. They haven't had conversations. So I want to add, so I want you to just think about that. I also want you to think about, you know, how can we advance a conversation? You know, what what do we what what how can we do? What what do we do? And one of the things that I suggest is that you start. What a novel idea that is. <laughs> you start. Uh, a lot of it does have to do with preparation, your own preparation, thinking about yourself and 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 doing that. Uh, but it, it has to do with invigorating and expanding our labor in, in certain kinds of ways. Um, uh, and doing what my mama used to say was, you know, seeing the humanity in, in other people. Uh, something that I, I know that many of you have been spending a lot of time doing. And, um, but, but, but really kind of examining that. Uh, and then emphasizing this, this difference um, between teaching and learning. So the question is, you know, how, how do you tell your story? And then how do you actively listen? Well, that would go beyond the time that we have here, uh, but that's one of the things that, <clears throat> excuse me, I explore in Beyond Roses in the third section, in the toolkit. 
uh, kind of giving you some ideas about how, do, where do you start in thinking about your own story? And what do you think, and, and what is it about your story that you share and that, uh, that you hold on to and that you build upon? And then, and then how do you actively listen to somebody else? So all of those tips are, are provided there. Now, I just like to conclude by just uh, suggesting that um, there is, th this is a book that I have been working on for a while. And uh, so you, I've told you some things about my mom and dad. Uh, and uh, I grew up as an only child in Tallahassee. And when my, when my mother, my father died in 1996, <clears throat> my mother died in 2007. And when she died, I went home to Tallahassee and um, I decided, you know, the first thing I did, I, I said, okay, I'm, I've got to organize things and get, put things in order. My mother was the meticulous, as I mentioned to you, she was the meticulous uh, kind of organizer, but you know, again, in, in trying to do something, I said, well, you know, I need to put some, some things in order. I opened the, a drawer. The first drawer that I opened in, in uh, the bedroom, there was a note from my mother and it said, Judy, do not throw away anything in these drawers. Love, mom. So it was my mother sp speaking to me, uh, knowing what I was about to do. But what I ended up finding was a, just a treasure trove of things, uh, including several hundred letters that my mother and father had written to each other during World War II. And uh, these are love letters. And they were love letters written um, between a man and a woman who were not supposed to love because they were black and because they were um, uh, middle class and because they were married. They were not supposed, according to the, the ways of the, of the historical, um, of the ways of society at that time, they were not supposed to. But so, so this book basically chronicles uh, that it, it builds upon the letters, it uses the stories that uh, the interviews that I had done with them, and then it expands beyond that. I, I found out that my dad was um, uh, among the last of the Buffalo soldiers. Uh, I had never known that before. Um, and I found out many other things. And I talk about the experiences of those black soldiers um, during that time and their relationships in terms of history. So it's coming soon. So be on the lookout for it. Um, and at that, with that, I think um, we'll open the floor for questions. Um, Judy, one question that has come up is, could you go more into uh, code switching? And um, I think there was a story in the book that talked about um, talked about that a bit. And I just think it'd be more people would want to know about that. Okay. Thank you so much for the um, for the question. And so for so um, the code switching is uh, is something that uh, many people in the especially in the black community and other communities uh, know about too um, it's it's something that people especially in black communities um, uh, learn to do because uh, it, it's it's a survival kind of mechanism it's it's the way that you would talk and interact and be in one community that would be different from the way that you would talk and interact in another community. And some people really kind of uh, uh, prepare their children to be able to do those kinds of things uh, so that they would be able to smoothly move from one place to another. Um, and uh, so there's, there's a story, let me see, there's a story in here that makes the point, um, okay. And this actually 
the, the, the story is actually uh, the obligation to speak is the, is the name of the story. And it actually kind of took place on the campus of, um, of Howard University uh, several years ago uh, when I was the uh, advisor to the student radio station. And so that was one of my responsibilities. And as a part of it, they had a, a hip hop concert. And, um, and, and it was a concert at the, at the big Crampton Auditorium and students from the entire university came and, and the like. And, and this particular incident that I'm going to read to you is the encounter that I had with one of the judges of the hip hop concert. Uh, and uh, and the and this was backstage, and you know the kids were all kind of preparing for things. But it, it really speaks to, to code switching. Um, the the quote that that I have before we before that is is from this young man who was the judge. He says, "I saw a black man shot down, and I cried. Not the first time it had happened, but for me, a time when it reverberated." And here's the story. I talked to a, this is now me talking. I talked to a brother today who had at least two tongues. He had mastered both so that he had become fluent, bilingual in a way. We sat backstage in Crampton Auditorium at Howard University before a DJ contest and carried on a conversation about his story. He showed me a photo of his artwork, bold and brazen, starkly laying bare a community's raw spots and tugging at wounds that some would rather hide. He had been beaten. He never knew why. Like so many black men before him and so many others since, he had found himself at the end of a policeman's billy club and then a taser. For no reason, he knew he had to stretch for his life hoping to continue to breathe when somebody misidentified him, misrecognized him, misclaimed him as guilty of something he did not do. Nobody on the force really explained. And when he demanded to know what drove the two Prince George's County police officers to twist his arms behind his back and wrench them into a hold clamped by iron, they told him nothing. When he insisted that they show their badge numbers, they simply said, just call me Sheriff one and Sheriff two. Let's skip down here. Um, uh, this young man, I'm sorry, it had, uh, it had happened two years before and like the warning before, he, oh, okay, let me just skip this. I'm sorry, this young man talking backstage at Crampton uh, described feeling like he had no power when his hands were behind his back. He said he thought he might be on the way to being counted among the dead. Uh, the police never gave him an answer on why he was beaten, never charged him with a crime. And I go, kind of go on to talk about it. Turns out that he, uh, in addition to being the, 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 uh, the DJ, um, being a judge for the DJ competition, he was also a master's student. He was studying for his master's and uh, in art. And he had done an art piece. Of, his thesis was on his experiences. And so I'll pick up there. He says, it, it's my thesis, the artist said, my way of saying something loud and insistent, clear and precise. The work showed a black man caught between the here and now of tragic moments and the historic arc that keeps happening. The photo of the thesis created a visual voice reminding me that we have averted our eyes too long. It's hard to say how voices will speak when confronting a horror, what language they choose to use to describe it, how that language can push someone else to do something or what difference any of it makes but clearly the prism of what language we use has a role in reframing ideas and moving things. One who is born to influence others, to help people shift power relationships, to force them to see in new ways, to use the language they know must do just that. We have an obligation to speak, to have more than polite conversations and to use whatever tongues we have available to do it. And what he had done was after he had this conversation with me and after he showed me his thesis work, he went out and he encountered 
um, 2,000 students there in Crampton Auditorium. And he spoke in a language that I did not know. There was a hip hop exchange and I was kind of, oh my goodness. Um, and, and what he was doing was he was code switching. Uh, he, was, he was using one language for one audience and another language for another audience. And that's what happens. Uh, and, and sometimes, and, and what happens is that most white people uh, who may experience don't even understand or recognize many white people who are not conscious of the fact that this happens, don't even understand or recognize that there is code switching that's going on um, in uh, sometimes in indigenous communities, sometimes in uh, com communities of color and other things of that sort. Um, but it's, it's, it's very important to understand that, that code switching happens. It's also important to understand how to code switch because uh, many white people uh, also code switch. And you might think about your experiences that you've had in places uh, where you've been, where you interact with people in your family in a way that's different from the way you interact with people at your job, it, which is different from the way that you interact with your people, with people of faith that you may be interacting with, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, the, 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 so the code switching means that you are conscious of uh, connecting with people where they are and moving them to where you want them to be. So that, that's the idea behind the code switching. That's the story. I just read as, you know, parts of it. Thank you, Judy. Um, we have a, a question from one of our audience, um, Diana, who would like to ask you a question in terms of code switching. Okay. Yes, thank you. Um, so, uh, uh, blessings. Thank you for being in this space and gracing us with your presence. Um, uh, for me, you know, I, I feel just in the past and just in my experiences as a Black woman, um, code switching can uh, be harmful. Um, and the way I view code switching sometimes is um, when there is a, when we fear, right? When we don't feel comfortable in spaces, um, and and so we code switch. So I, I was curious to know because you mentioned that we can use that as a tool. Um, so I was curious to know um, in what ways, and and also what ways that it doesn't present itself as harmful to Black bodies. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much, Diana, for, for that question. And uh, one of the things that you mentioned is that, that idea of fear. Um, and, and fear is so critical. It, it's, it's the major kind of reason um, that we are hesitant, um, you know, and about having conversations, about engaging in conversations, whether we're using code switching or anything else. I mean, fear is is um, kind of drives so much of, of so, so many of our decisions. Um, and, and, and there are different kinds of fears, but there, there's fear of the racial other, you know, the, the fear of the, of the one who's kind of different from myself. Um, and, uh, and, and then there, there's fear, you know, there's a book, um, Howard Thurman, uh, uh, this, is, this is actually called Jesus and the Disinherited. Um, and the great theologian Howard Thurman talks about fear. And he, he kind of alludes to code switching too in this. But th this book, by the way, is a book that um, is, a, is a very critical book. Uh, Howard Thurman was um, a mystic, uh, but he also was a Christian um, theologian who was at Howard University, was the dean of the chapel there, but he also then kind of went on to Boston University, did, uh, I'm, get, I'm getting back to the question, but, but he did, he, he did um, it became the chaplain there and then, then started the first interfaith, interracial um, congregation out on the West Coast back in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and um, but 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 his teaching is is so critical. Martin Luther King, by the way, when he was assassinated, 
at the Lorraine Motel had a copy of this book on him. He carried, carried it with him everywhere he went, uh, just as did John Lewis. Um, they, and, and so many of them carried that book. But, but in it, I, I mentioned, because there's a whole chapter on fear. And one of the things that he's, uh, one, one of the things he says is, uh, is that he, he reminds us that you know, there, there's fear of being misunderstood and being labeled, uh, being labeled in a certain kind of way, but the, the, there's the fear of the one who uh, feels that he or she does not have power. And then there is the fear of the one who believes that he or she does have power. Um, and so, and, and they are afraid that the power may be taken away. Um, and so, you know, all of those things kind of happen. You know, there's, there's a fear of being misunderstood, as I said, the fear of being labeled a racist, uh, the fear of being labeled a victim, the fear of, um, uh, the fear of one's body being harmed, uh, you know, there are all kinds of things. But what Thurman suggests and uh, what King uh, was mentored to do and what uh, so many others have been, is, is to talk about the empowering nature of AC. So, so they, they, they talk about, you know, fear and hatred and deception as, as three things that we need to kind of root out of the psyche so that we replace them with love. Um, and, uh, and, and, and at the heart of that is understanding that, that uh, is turning, turning that fear around so that it is not a debilitating kind of thing, but so that it empowers us to move. So getting back to the question about, um, uh, about the code switching, uh, it, it's not just kind of looking at fear in a narrow way, it's looking at fear in all of these different ways and understanding that those, that the fear is happening on a lot of different sides. So when we, we witness a lot of the violence that we're witnessing, we're, wit we're witnessing fear, we're witnessing fear, uh, you know, and so anyway. Thank you, that's helpful. Thank you, Judy. Um, I. To add to that, Barbara says, and sometimes the fear is simply that we may miss the opportunity to connect, hence we code switch as a tool to connect. Um, also, Ebony uh, wrote that there is an NPR podcast called The Code Switch, mm -hmm. and in the chat um, has put uh, the link for that mm -hmm. podcast so yeah. you can find it there. One. it's an excellent one and they they, they deal with these issues uh, a lot on very practical very real uh you know incidents and, and the like and and it, it's that podcast uncovers the, and what they use is, is stories they use a lot of stories they've used a lot if they talk with people they use the narrative and 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 at the basis of that <clears throat> excuse me is the assumption that um, that narratives heal. Mm -hmm. That's the basis for that, that podcast. Thank you for reminding us of that. Uh, several people have asked about um, the name of the book again, and Sandy wrote Jesus and the Disinherited by Thurman. What is his first name again? Howard Thurman. Howard Thurman. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and uh, again, <clears throat> when you start looking at the people who, uh, you know, in addition to, uh, to the ones that I mentioned, um, you know, you can go down the line. Of, you look at all of those kind of <clears throat> folks who were in that first wave of civil rights folks carried this around. <clears throat> um, and Howard Thurman, yeah, I actually had a chance to meet Howard Thurman when I was a little girl, didn't know what it was. My, right. my parents uh, went from Tallahassee to, to Boston every summer to go to graduate school. Now they did that because they were at Florida a and 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 they couldn't go across the street to Florida State University to uh, to get their graduate degree. So they traveled <clears throat> all the way up from Florida to uh, Boston uh, to go to Boston University, and they were there when um, when Thurman was um, uh, the dean of the chapel, and so. 
I remember being a little girl and going to hear, and I have no idea what he said or anything, but I do remember the experience of being there. <clears throat> and I remember how transformative it was, obviously for my parents. I didn't understand exactly what was going on, but I knew that there was something, some message. But this is a book I've read at least um, four times. And I still, <laughs> I still used to have that little things all over it. I still, I'm like, and it, it's only 102 pages. So, wow. Um, in chat, also, um, someone you may be familiar with, Joe, says, Fear is a false evidence appearing real. <laughs> I do know Joe. Yes. That's my husband. <laughs> False evidence appearing real, yes. And uh, you know, one of the things that uh, Joe Latta is famous for is is uh, acronyms. Uh, and so the F E A R uh, is is one thing that he uh, has come up with. Um, in addition to kind of being a, a fabulous retired uh, pedodontist, um, uh, he is also an extraordinary uh, person who um, thinks about uh, language and connections and things of that sort. So thank you, Joe, for that. <laughs> uh, I'd like to encourage people to uh, put your questions in chat and also, or if you prefer to raise your hand, you can go to the reaction icon at the bottom of your screen. And at the very bottom, there's a a bar that says raise hand and I'll try to watch for raised hands too. So please feel free. Uh, Jessica has a question. Okay. Hi, Jessica. Hi, Judy. Thank you for this tonight. Um, I am a white woman married to a black man. I have mixed race children. And one thing that I run into um, and find really frustrating is that I have a lot of these personal sherry, uh, stories that I often share with my parents about experiences that my family has. And while my parents are always sympathetic towards my kids or my husband, um, they don't really understand um, the stories of other people outside of my family. They don't seem to make that connection. Um, so it's like sympathy for my son, but not other young black men who experience these difficulties. So how, I guess, how do I bridge that gap? Because we're all finding it really difficult to even talk to them on any level at this point. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And that's, that's, a, that's a very good question. It's, uh, it's one um, that, we're, that we're seeing more and more, especially as, um, uh, as 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 the the world is opening up and and as we are having more of these kind of situations, we're thinking about people in our family who are very different in their um, their thoughts and their experiences from us, uh, or they uh, think, or there may be things that we've had, exposures that we've had um, that they that they have no no. Um, you know, they, 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 they just, they can't identify with. Uh, one thing I would suggest, you know, is that, you know, and we said this at the beginning, you know, this is tough work. This is not easy. And I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm telling you and you know, it's tough. So uh, it, it's, it's, it's about finding a way and the way is not necessarily just one way. There may be multiple ways. Um, it's, it's, and it's not necessarily about having a, a big uh, chat or whatever. It's about one-on-one -on -one ways. It's about helping people to understand the humanity by seeing, by help, helping them to see the similarities between themselves and uh, the other human experiences um, that someone who's different from them might have. Uh, I, think, I think it was uh, Chimamanda in Gozi Adichie who said, um, it is morally urgent to have honest conversations. Mm -hmm. It is morally urgent to have honest conversations. And so it, it, it may be that at some point, and of course you, would, you can best gauge what this is, uh, that 
you can then just kind of mention that. Have you ever talked to them about that? Yeah, so my mom and I actually have some really good dialogue um, about it. And my son and my mom also do. Um, her husband is not as open to it. Um, and, you know, my son loves them both very much and is close with both of them. But he is finding it difficult at this point to talk with them, with Tom specifically, um, because he just is very much, you know, I, I didn't own slaves. I don't have a role in this. Um, all the really common things, you know, my life was hard too. Mm -hmm. And the conversation just kind of dies right there. Mm -hmm. Well, understand this, that his life was hard too. And, uh, and it's good to, to hear that. Uh, <laughs> and so sometimes, you know, um, it, it, it is ab about the sharing and it's not just about kind of the, 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 the one way. So it's, it's a repeated thing. It's, it's, you kind of come back to it and you, you, you uh, continue, don't give up. You just keep doing that. Um, there are some exercises. Uh, well, I'm not sure they would necessarily help there, but there are some exercises that could help um, you as you're thinking about how how do I, you know, how, how am I feeling about all of this? Because see, you, you your partner um, has different experiences from you. Your children, you are preparing children who will have different experiences from yours. Um, but it, again, as you look forward, you also have to look back and connect with your, um, your other family members. So uh, I think it's just, it, 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 it's, it's gonna take time but it's one of those things that you just keep right on doing. And, and you, you look for the value that uh, they have and, and the stories that they have too. That's it's helpful, not, thank you. It's not, it's not just that you tell, that you say, listen to my story. The thing is, what is yours? Thank you, that's helpful. Uh, in chat, uh, there have been, Ebony has put in a few really good uh, things to read. One of them is um, from Washington Post, watch a black man and his white mom discuss how he was beaten by police. And also another story, uh, I think there, if you check chat, you'll find some really good resources. Um, and let's see. Please share an example of a storytelling hope circle as described as one way to start the conversations. Storytelling. Uh, oh, okay. Story hope, I think. Is story. Yeah, 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 sure. Uh, okay, so. Yeah, let me. So, so, uh, so, so here's one, I, I won't read the whole story, but I can tell you about this. Um, so this one is called uh, Look Alike. And um, it's a story that I wrote about um, some, an encounter that I had with a young white woman when I was a, uh, an undergraduate student at Hampton. And, um, of course, Hampton, at the time I went, was Hampton Institute, it's now Hampton University. <clears throat> when I was there, uh, I had, for, for most of the time that I was there, I had the same roommate. Um, and, but there was one semester when she was on exchange in another country, and um, I was given a, an exchange student to be my roommate. And this was a young woman from the Midwest who was a white woman. And, um, and the discussion it, here that we actually, so there was a, so this is a, a, a conversation that we, we actually had. Um, and she actually said um, something about all black people looking alike. And I said, well, to me, all white people look alike. And and we actually kind of got into this discussion. So this story is about that, um, about 
what it was we were thinking uh, when we said that. Because when I said, well, you know, one day as we discussed some of those things, I'm not sure why I said it, but I did. I said, all white people look alike to me. My statement hung heavy on the air. Um, and then, you know, we kind of go through and she seemed hurt and genu genuinely surprised by my abrupt admission. And for a second, I regretted my honesty. But then a door opened. Actually, she responded, black people are the ones who look alike. Now I was dumbfounded. dumbfounded. She must be crazy. How could she even imagine that all black folks look alike? Because black folks I knew were so distinctive from each other in their resemblance. Couldn't she see that our skin was very, uh, was every color of the spectrum and therefore clearly we looked different? And so I said it, we are not alike at all. Then I went through the whole thing about the skin and all of that kind of thing. And then, then, she, then she said, um, she said, but your hair is all so similar in color. Mm. And I was like, hair. And then she went through this whole thing about um, dusty blonde and you know, the, all, you know, all these different kinds of colors um, and, and, and uh, strawberry blondes and redheads and dusty you know, brunettes and da da, da 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 da. And I had never thought about it. I had never thought about hair as a distinguishing characteristic. I had always thought about skin. And so there we had, so it was the beginning of a conversation where we could talk about what we really thought because I had been looking at skin and she had been looking at hair. We we're talking about two different things. So, so, so he, here was a, a conversation starter, if you will. But there are other, you know, there are lots of things that could be conversation starters. You can talk, you know, and, and, and I do suggest a number of them in, in here because people come at these things with the lens, uh, the lenses that they have uh, that are all different. Yes, I was actually thinking, formulating a question around that too, in that um, we can be talking in a conversation, but thinking of two different things so that it's like passing, it's like not quite connecting. And how do we, like, how do we connect when, when our whole, um, frame of reference could be so different and yet we're both in the same place. I, that's how yeah, I, no, I understand what you're saying. Yeah, no, and, and it's a good question. Uh, so if we're talking about two different things and we, I mean, that, that happened to me the other night. I, I was with my writing group and th these, these are absolutely wonderful. There are eight of us. And these are absolutely wonderful um, folks. Uh, there are two of us who are two black women, and um, uh, and then there are um, uh, three um, white women, and then the others are men. And um, and I was reading something from something that I had submitted, and I was talking about growing up and uh, and on the campus of Florida A and M, at at my school the elementary school, and I talked about cracked windows and used books. And one of the white women who is just, a, just, a, I mean, I, I absolutely love her, said, but I don't understand how that could be because you were on the campus of a university. How could you have used books at the demonstration school on that campus and how could you have cracked windows? And so I explained to her that, 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 uh, that there were different resources that had come to the different universities. So the black university did not have the same resources that the other university had. And so that it was possible to have it. So, so we were talking and we were kind of talking about two different things, uh, but that happens. And, and the only way that we can um, kind of bridge that is to talk, is to start. Uh, and so when I explained to her about my my experience and she said oh i never thought about that just as when the my my friend who was my roommate um told me about the hair i said you know i never thought about that. i really had not thought about that now that might sound like an incredible thing but i never thought about it. i had looked at people and not even seen the hair 
color? Well, we are actually, this time went so fast, we're coming up onto 8.30 right now. I want to um, end this portion with uh, one more thing from chat, uh, it, more of an observation from Barbara. And she says, I think that many Euro-Americans have a difficult time acknowledging the history of the tragedy of what has happened to our Black brothers and sisters because, because we or they and our and their ancestors have a shared history of denying their own reasons uh, for fleeing their motherlands and the trauma in their own lineage. This is why I think knowing your own history helps us understand the history of our brothers and sisters here in America. Um, and I think, oh, Robbie has her hand up and this will be the last question uh, for, for this session. But that said, we are definitely will stay here. Uh, you can stay as long as you'd like. Uh, and more questions will be answered. So Robbie, uh, why don't you uh, take us home? Well, you know, it's funny because as I'm listening, good evening, everybody. I'm thinking about the work that I've done uh, with children and children never talked about skin color. You know, kids would talk about the color that somebody was wearing with their clothing and they just saw things differently. And I always found it interesting that adults saw the color of green and that's how they would distinguish people. Wasn't so much by their skin color, but by how much money they were able to exercise and leverage for their life existence. And, you know, I, I just find it very fascinating being born in 1964, kind of the civil rights movement was my childhood. So part of my parents who came from the South were saying, you have a right, you have to exercise your freedom, you have, you know, our history that keeps you strong, but they didn't talk about their history too much. And when they talked about it, it was almost like it was a whisper thing they were going to talk about. And there was something about, you know, we're going to tell you the family history, but we're just we're not going to tell you too much. About it. And I don't understand why families do that. And, you know, the behavior of people is really fascinating to watch. And the discussion about the color of our skin is so many other conversations within that one topic that is a lifetime of healing that we're all going to continue to um, acknowledge, accept, and then practice but it takes those stages of every individual to kind of go through how they're going through it, their way to go through it. And then they get through it and then, oh, we're in the same place looking around saying, oh, wow, now what? Now what? We just have to keep moving forward and keeping all the things that we keep learning as part of what we know and understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, Robbie, you, um... You, you have mentioned a number of things, uh, but, but, but certainly you're, you're absolutely right that there are things that we have swept under the rug. They're, they're difficult uh, things that, that we in our own families have not talked about um, with our own children. We have not talked about with our parents. We have not talked about. And we've come to find, find things and then we're amazed to learn but it's not new. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a history that has kind of continued um, and ha has been there. So th there has to be some place where you break the silence. And there has to be some point where um, we say, we're not going to be silent anymore. We are going to deal with these tough things, these conversations that are hard uh, about skin and perceptions of race, because that's another whole thing. Uh, and, um, you know, th th there have to be ways, th th there has to be some kind of absolute uh, declaration that says, it stops here, it stops with me. I'm going to share, I'm going to be uh, the one, I'm going to have the courage. I I'm angry at the way things are, but I have the courage to do something about it. Um, 
and to do it with love and nonviolence. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, thank you so much, Judy. Oh, you have just been, this has been wonderful. Um, this concludes the actual take part event. Um, but as I said, we, we will stay here as long as people want to ask questions uh, or visit uh, for at least a few more minutes. So um, thank you all for coming tonight. We will have another session uh, next in February. And um, I believe it's Sharon Gary Smith from the local NAACP who will be our speaker. Uh, so please, we'll be sending out information on it. So please save the date, third Tuesday of the month. So thank you again, everybody. Thank you, Victoria. Can I just say one more thing? I Absolutely. Just to, I just want to just, uh, again, uh, applaud you, uh, take part um, for making that radical choice to, um, to be the difference. Uh, because um, it, it just kind of, it, it, it's, it's tough work. And uh, I saw that, you know, what was happening in your city, as well as in mine, um, just yesterday and today. Uh, and so you see, we've got a lot of work to do, but we've got to have the conversations and it is indeed morally urgent for us to have these honest conversations. So thank you so much for the work that you're doing and thank you for inviting me.